All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Ashton Williams. Um, I work at Odyssey. Um, I'm on Twitter like everyone else. And I'm talking about um, advanced Xcode, specifically configurations, targets, and schemes. Uh, that's Xcode, if you haven't used it before. Um, hopefully you have. I will be showing how to do some things, but I might brush over things that I kind of assume people know. Uh, feel free to interrupt me if you want me to actually show something. I do have some demos prepared, um, if there's time. So I want to cover some terminology first. Um, before I get into some of the more advanced things. So this is actually, I guess, the basic part of this presentation. Um, so targets. In an Xcode project, you have targets. Um, a target is a combination of inputs, usually source files and resources, and then instructions on how to build them and, how to, and what to build them with, like the Swift compiler, uh, into creating some kind of product, usually an app or a framework, or might be a, a testing target. So that's a bunch of tests that you can then run. Um, and projects contain you know, one or more targets. Um, they can depend on other targets, actually. So if you have some unit tests or UI tests, usually they'll be dependent upon your app target. So when you run your UI tests, it has to build your app to run them. Um, some examples, if you're kind of not getting what I'm talking about, is you know, your app has a target, so usually be the name of your app. Uh, unit tests, UI tests, your watch app, any uh, extensions that you might have for iOS or OS X. Uh, any questions on that? No? Not going too fast? Um, another part of targets is build phases. So each target has a set of build phases. Um, there are some built-in ones, like compile the code is usually one of them, um, but also include any resources, like PNGs or icons, um, and also linking libraries. So if you're using um, you know, Realm, I've heard about that one, um, you know, that will be a build phase, is linking in Realm to your application. Um, and the other one is build settings. So build settings are options for the build phases. Um, they're basically just a bunch of variables um, when building a target. Um, you can specify build settings at the project level, and all targets can access them. Or you can override them in each target. Um, each project level build setting applies um, to all targets, unless overridden. Um, a target inherits all the project build settings. Um, but you, know, you can override them, and I'll follow up on that uh, a bit later. Um, next up is configurations. So a configuration is basically just a set of build settings. Um, so if you have a target, which has build settings, you then have a configuration, which is another set of build settings. Um, so the usual ones you get from any uh, Xcode template are debug and release configurations. Um, so you'll notice that your app kind of gets built a little bit differently if you're debugging it from Xcode versus archiving it, uploading it to the App Store and downloading it. Uh, next is schemes. So schemes are a little weird. Um, so there can only be one active scheme within the Xcode IDE at a time. Um, and Xcode schemes are specific to a target, but there can be multiple targets involved. So basically, a scheme is a target plus a specific build configuration plus an executable environment. Um, and the executable environment, by that I mean either a run environment. So how do I run this app from Xcode? If I'm just running it onto a device or the simulator, What's the environment that it's running in? Um, there's also test environments and analyze environments if you're using the static analyzer. 
Um, so here's what I mean. So here we have a, a scheme. It is running the puppy target. Um, I've selected the run action in the scheme. And we can see that the scheme has selected the debug build configuration. And the arguments, options, and diagnostics tabs that are there are the run environment. Conversely, uh, a test action has less tabs at the top there, so there's a reduced set of um, environments that you can play with. And tests also let you, let you select um, which tests to actually run as part of the environment. And so this is, um, this is still the puppy target, but you'll notice that these tests come from a test target. So there's kind of a, a relation there going on. And lastly, archive has no um, environment. It's simply select a configuration. Usually it's a release. If you accidentally put that to debug, you'll have problems with iJuice. Um, for more visual people, I'll go through the things. So here on the left, this is the puppy project. There are two targets, puppy framework target and the puppy test. Um, and you can see here that there are some configurations listed, debug and release. Um, the based on configuration file here is for um, XE configs, which are basically an external file where you can put build settings and some other things. Uh, I won't be covering those, uh, but you should look them up. They're called um, XE configs. If you have used CocoaPods, CocoaPods um, will generate some XE configs, which um, XE configs have one advantage of you can create as many levels of, I guess, inheritance as you want. So usually CocoaPods will give you some XE configs as a base for you to then configure over the top in Xcode and then to configure over the top in your targets for each configuration. So it can get quite complicated. Um, and there's also a scheme in the top there. It says puppy, and it's going to run on an iPad 2 simulator. Um, here's a, just a quick tip. So here I've selected the build settings for the puppy target. Um, and notice that the preprocessor macros build setting here, um, it has a little disclosure indicator. You can expand that and then see that it has different values depending on the configuration. Remember that I said configuration is just a set of build settings. Um, so a tip here is if you select one of these um, build settings and open the quick help inspector here, I'm sure everyone can see that, um, it tells you the declaration. That's very important. That's what you want to be Googling when you want to know what the hell this is and how do you use it. It also gives you a brief description, um, but if you look up the official Apple, Apple documentation, there's, there'll be a ton of detail about how you can use this, what gets used, you know, whether this only applies to watchOS or whatever. Um, so look up that declaration, and that gives you sort of a you know, C macro style identifier. Um, otherwise, you'll just be trying to Google preprocessor macros, which will give you a lot of results. Um, yeah. Um, another tip is notice here that this preprocessor macros build setting is in bold. Um, so when the font is bold, um, it's a little bit harder to see on the selected item, um, but that's also bold. Um, that means that it's been set in the target. Um, you can select it and press delete, and it'll go back to using the project level value. So that was uh, me pressing delete, and now I just get uh, debug one back from the project. Uh, another quick tip is if it's a multi-value build setting, um, you can use dollar inherited here. It's an expression, so that means it'll be in addition to the project level settings or any settings that have come before it. 
So if it's already at the project level, it'll inherit from uh, XE config file or something like that. Um, so that's very useful, especially for ones like preprocessor macros, where just because you're adding another preprocessor macro doesn't mean you want to lose the debug flag. That'll uh, break some stuff. And just to cover all bases, so the, the ways to add and manipulate all these things I've just explained is from the editor menu. There you can do targets, configurations, build settings, build phases, uh, build rules I'm not covering. Um, and then the schemes are under the product. Because um, schemes, in effect, have to do with after you've built something, what are you doing with it? Are you running it? Are you testing it? Are you analyzing it? Are you archiving it? Um, and schemes there, you can actually select the current scheme um, or create one or manage them or delete them. And destinations, just to cover that as well, because it's in the same section within the menu. Um, that's, just whether, that's just a device to run on or a simulator or some kind of generic build device. And that determines the architecture that the binary is going to build for. So whether that's you know, ARM or x86. Um, so some build settings are affected by the currently selected uh, destination. So that's something to be aware of. You've probably noticed if you've ever archived an application and accidentally had a simulator still selected, it'll say, you know, what are you doing? So you have to select generic iOS device and then it will actually build it for all architectures so that it can run on all devices. Okay, are there any questions for all that? No. All right, very good. You're all paying very good attention. So now we know the terminology. Let's put this to work, all right? Let's get some advanced stuff going on. So build phase scripts. So we learned about build phases. That's um, things to do with the inputs, the source code, the resources, all that stuff. Um, you can do your own. So you can create a run script, and then that can be a bash script, a Perl script, a Ruby script pretty much anything. You can just shell out to any application you've got installed. Um, and do whatever you want. And that'll be included as part of the build process. Um, so if you're familiar with make files, this is kind of like that, where Xcode gives you a lot of the stuff for free. Like it you know, calls the Swift compiler for free. You never have to say, hey, compile these Swift files. You just have them all in your project. Um, but if you wanted to run. Um, Swift lint maybe is part of your build process or a code formatter or do some other stuff that maybe Xcode doesn't give you out of the box. Um, run scripts are super good for that. Um, before I go on, um, so run scripts, all the build settings are available as environment variables within the script. So if it's a bash script, they're available in the environment. That's a good thing to remember. Um, so an example of something awesome you can do with a run script um, that Xcode kind of doesn't provide you. Um, so you kind of have to figure this one out yourself is, um, let's say you have app transport security exceptions for your debug build because your test environment doesn't have full SSL, or maybe you're just connecting to localhost. So to get that to work, you have to put an ATS exception in your info plist to say, just let me do whatever I want, it's okay. But it would be pretty embarrassing if you released your app to the App Store saying, hey, this app connects to insecure servers, especially if your production servers are actually fully ATS compliant. Um, so you can save yourself some pain and do this automatically by including that in a build phase. So here's a, a simplified build phase script that I use, um, which is it's checking the configuration, which is um, exposed as a build setting for convenience. I check that it's release. If it's release, then I'm going to delete app transport security from the info plist. So that'll give me whatever the defaults Apple have said apps should comply with. Were there some questions on that? No? So that, that's a cool one. Um, I, will, I will have uh, resources available afterwards. Yes? Well, you've got Echo. Is that just Echo that the console inside Echo? Yes, so I will, I will show that in a minute where that shows up. Um, there is a trick there. Um, if you echo error colon, that'll actually come up 
as an error message within the build log. And the return value of this script um, also affects whether the build succeeds or not. So you can, this could check whether app transport security is not there and fail the build for release. Here I've chosen to just, you know, do the hard work and delete it for you. Um, so here's how you would um, chuck that in. Sorry, I think I'm missing a slide where I actually show how to put that in. But basically you press the plus button there once you're in build phases, you can select a build phase script and you can just chuck this code right in there. Um, so we can improve on that a bit better by creating our own build setting. Um, so if you go to build settings, notice there's a plus here as well. Right there. Um, and if we press that, we can add a user-defined setting. When we add a user-defined setting, we see this. Sorry if that's hard to see. Um, and we can just type in any name for it. Uh, usually they're all caps, so you should follow that convention. Um, and just like all other build settings, you can have these be different values depending on the configuration. And you can also create custom build settings at the project level and then override them in any target and so on. So here I've said instead of always removing it in a release configuration, here it's a bit easier to configure. You don't have to go edit a, a bash script if you want to change how this works. Instead, I'm using a build setting as a configuration, sorry, as a setting for my build phase script, just like all the other ones work. Um, here's an example of it running. So we can see that I'm building the target egg. Um, don't ask. The configuration is debug, destinations and iPad 2. There it's run the built-in build phases, compiling the Swift code, copying a header, copying some resources, compiling a storyboard, some other stuff. Um, and then it, third from the bottom there, you'll see it's run the custom shell script, remove ATS. So this was the debug configuration. Now in the release configuration here, um, if you notice, I've created a scheme that has changed the configuration from debug to release. Um, so now this egg target has built and the run custom shell script remove ATS has echoed a message saying it removed ATS from info plist. So there we see a custom build, build script using a custom build setting um, to have different inputs, different behaviors. Any questions on that? Yes? Yes, you can. Um, so there is one of the build settings is basically the path to your info plist. So yes, you could have different info plists and depending on the configuration, point to a different file. Um, there's also options to pre-process the info plist, which lets you use um, like macros inside the info plist itself and expand them. And there's also an option to have a an info plist base that then gets merged with another info plist. So it can get quite complicated, yes. Um, this was just sort of a simple example of something that um, is just deleting one item, which can be very handy. Is there another question? No? All right, thanks. Um, now I want to talk about configurations and resources. Um, so let's say you have a test build. If you have a testing team, you have a build that you ship to your testers. And you might also have a beta build. If you've got a release coming up and you want to get some testing uh, with real users, you might have a beta. So you would have different resources for these different versions of your app. Um, different app icons, maybe you have a settings bundle that has some different options. Maybe in, um, in your test build, you can switch what environment, what server you're pointing to. Um, there might be some test data that you can load up. Maybe there's some like secret account that um, has all the options needed to test the app robustly. So 
you can use configurations to help you build this. So all the Xcode templates by default give you debug and release, um, but you can create a new configuration. So what if we created a test configuration? And a beta configuration. Now we've got more ways to build our app. We've got a new set of build settings that we can apply to any target. I'll just show how to do that. So this is the Nectarine project. Um, I created this uh, when Peach was a thing. That was a long time ago. Never mind. So there's a little plus icon again here. Or you could go to the edit menu, uh, the editor menu. Um, we're going to duplicate the release configuration because our, our beta and test builds are closer to a release build than they are uh, a debug build. So we want to start off with all those build settings for a release build. Uh, for instance, the beta build, you might be submitting to test flight. So that needs to be a build that you know, doesn't have all your debug code in there. You want it to be optimized, things like that. So you want those build settings. Here we've chosen to name it beta. Sorry. So now that we've got our beta configuration, let's get our resources in order. So you might have a resources directory that has um, some, some files in there, some icons, some graphics, um, or a settings bundle. Um, and but they're not related to a configuration. They're related to a target. You might have noticed when you add an image or use an asset catalog, it's for a particular target. It's not tied to a configuration. So for instance, this doesn't just magically work. Your resources for your app are always the resources in your app. You don't get separate ones for release. You don't get separate ones for test. You don't get separate, sorry. If I had a slide for it, you wouldn't get separate ones for beta either. So build settings can be changed per, conf per configuration, but resources can't. Um, but we can overcome this because we can script Xcode to do whatever we want. So here is a simplified script. Sorry, I put the tiny URL at the bottom, but again, this will be available later. Um, so this script is basically going to say, all right, depending on the configuration, I want to copy some resources. You notice here that it's using a convention of uh, the resources path dash configuration name. So like on the slide I had previously, we're basically making this work. So now we're saying, yes, if there are resources in resources dash test, include them in the test configuration so they'll be in the test build. Are there any questions on that? Yes? What use cases do you have to apply this? Um, so if you have different app icons for a beta version of your app or a release version. Also, if your, if your test build has um, some debug settings or some test data built into it, stuff that you don't want in the release version, but that you do want to be readily available in a test version of your app. Um, so if you're an indie developer, you maybe don't need all this, but if you're working on like enterprise applications, usually you'll have a swath of builds that you need to produce for different teams within the organization. Hey, um, yep. about how, how Xcode does all of its building in basically a separate folder, so it's special for building compared to where your project actually is. Yep. Uh, so there's a, like a, there's a few directories actually. There's, um, there's the code siding folder path. There's the built products path. Um, I'm not going to cover all that, but um, feel free to look it up. It is quite complicated. Um, if you've ever uh, built something and then had to go and find why an error was, you'll see that it's just these massive path names with all these files. Um, a lot goes into building an application, turns out. Um, yeah. So here, yes, I have had to look these up. So these are, some of these are build settings, and some of them are just uh, environments that Xcode sets when it will build your source code. Um, but you can Google all these. There's documentation. Um, there are tons of like, special configuration names for each code in the path. 
Yeah. Um, another good thing, um, which I might be able to very quickly show. Well, maybe not. I'm, ran I'm run running out of time. Um, so if there's time at the end or if you come see me later, I can show you something where um, you can output what all the environment variables are available to your build script and then kind of figure them out from there. So you can kind of reverse engineer it a bit. And say like, oh, okay, so all my, all my compiled Swift code gets put in this directory before it gets put into my application. So if I wanted to modify, for some reason, my compiled Swift code, that's where you would look for it. That's a great point, Stu. So there is one caveat to this. Um, sorry, can you repeat your question? Will it copy the resources from those configuration folders, even if they're not linked to the target? Even if you have yes. Because it's not yes. So this is sort of, instead of using the built-in Xcode option of for each resource, you can select a target, I am not doing that, and I am instead copying it myself based on the configuration. Xcode has a built-in build phase to copy all the resources for a target. Uh, so that's a good point. Thanks, Stu. Um, so if we were to create this resources release directory, um, the big caveat here is that we don't want to add it to a target because I'm going to do that myself in a script. So this is a pretty big gotcha. You can accidentally click that and then your resources are always going to be included. Um, so always, always validate your builds afterwards, especially if you're doing custom stuff like this. So we're also going to create a folder reference rather than create a group. This is just so that in Xcode, the contents of that directory are always visible in there. And since I'm not adding them to a target, um, some gotchas around using folder references don't apply. Um, so here's uh, like a settings bundle. Here you can notice on the left that I have a settings bundle for debug. There might be some feature toggles available. Um, but in the settings bundle for release, I don't have that. So here's where I want my debug build to have more features than the release build. But I don't want to create a new target because then I have to select all my resources, all my source code, build that again, I have to manually duplicate all my build settings, all that stuff. So here, using the configuration, which is already per target, um, to do the resources. Um, also, if you do do this, be aware that a settings bundle is a directory. Um, so they will, it'll get merged when it gets copied. So here's, running, here's adding that script. So add a run script. Here I've put the, the script to copy the resources per configuration in an external file. Um, and you can just call that script uh, from here. SRC root means it refers to your project root. So within my project folder, I have nectarine, support, and then the script. And here's a tip. So I'm going to create a scheme now called nectarine release. You remember a scheme has a configuration set for a given target. So I'm going to create a version of Nectarine that I can run always in release mode. This will let me test whether the script actually works. So see here, the, the run environment has the build configuration as debug. Go and change that to release. I could also do the same for beta. Sorry, I skipped that rather quickly. Um, and when I run this, I can see that with the debug scheme, the default scheme, um, I have feature toggles. And in the release scheme, I don't. And it tells me that this is indeed the, the release build. So I am running out of time. Um, are there any questions? Mm -hmm. All right, good. I might um, go into my question time, since I've been taking questions throughout. So real quick, schemes and user defaults. Um, another bringing together one of these basic concepts of Xcode's build system and using it uh, with something else. So what are user defaults, if you don't know? 
So use the defaults. It's the default system provided on OS X and iOS. It's basically your preferences and settings. Um, you're probably more familiar with NS user defaults, or I think it is actually called user defaults now in Swift 3. Um, there are runtime arguments. There's another place where user defaults can be set. So that's part of a scheme's uh, run environment. Um, that's If you've used a command line application like git, that's like when you say git dash dash, you know, head or force, um, that's an argument. You can have arguments for your iOS application as well, actually. Uh, not usually on a device, but from within Xcode, yes. And also the, the settings app. So if you have a settings bundle, the settings app actually drives user defaults. All those options and settings and toggles within settings app get saved to user defaults. Then when you open your app, you read the user defaults and then the values from settings. Um, just quickly, I'll go over some domains. So there's a NS global domain for user defaults. Um, that's meant to be seen by all applications. I think iOS might have some of these, but they're read-only, um, or at least read-only to all your applications. It's mostly on OS X. Um, the argument domain are the ones passed in as arguments, and the registration domain are temporary defaults um, that are basically fallback values. So if this value isn't set, check all the other domains, fall back to the registration domain for my temporary defaults. Uh, that's very handy if you are storing um, something in NS user defaults and it really shouldn't be nil or your application will blow up. Uh, just register a default to the default. So it's a bit weird. Um, so here's settings if you haven't seen it. Um, here's the banana app with some options in there. So this toggle uh, will be a yes, no value in NS user defaults, and the slider will be um, a number. Uh, name would be, would be a string. So here it is. How do you create a settings page? I might skip over this in the need of time. Um, there's a lot of documentation on this and probably a ton of tutorials on how to create uh, settings. So runtime arguments. So I said on command line, you can pass arguments to any application that you run on command line. From within Xcode, the run environment can also pass arguments. Um, and it can, what was that? I don't know where it went. That's a disaster. Did anyone see that? Hopefully this works. So I broke it last time as well. The, so here I've got an argument passed on launch. I've created a banana scheme. I don't know where these names came from. I've created a banana scheme with a user default value of the argument preference is Gatorade. I love Gatorade. I could also register a default uh, drink favorite thing. Uh, so I can make it so that if someone doesn't have a preference, I'm going to give them Gatorade. So here is some old Objective-C code Ugh. to uh, register the defaults. The, the main takeaway here is the register defaults method, um, which just takes a dictionary, which you could read from a file or just hard code in. So here we have our banana target. I'm going to create a scheme. I'm going to add my Gatorade preference there. The syntax, by the way, for these arguments is dash key and then the value. Um, so this is a sh this is kind of a just a nice thing that iOS does for you. If there's a dash at the start of any key pair of runtime arguments, it puts that into user defaults for you. Otherwise, you would need to read the arguments from the process info object, um, which is a little bit harder to use. So this automatically converts the value into you know, a Boolean or whatever. So when we look at our run environment, we're looking at the, there's the info tab, the options tab, which has some cool things like uh, simulating location. 
that was great for hacking Pokemon Go. And Diagnostics has some really great sort of debugger things. Um, and these are things that you wouldn't want to be but like coded into your application. These are things that it's only when you're running your application do you want to be you know, looking for zombie objects. That's not something you build into your application. So these are run environment options. So when we put them together, another example could be an API URL. If your application is talking to an API, then maybe we um, provide a default in the code, so we register the default, or it could be an option in the settings app. Maybe not for release, maybe just for test and debug, you might want to switch environments. Probably not for release, that's pretty uncommon. Um, but we can override it in a scheme. So here, with my great banana app, I've got a staging server and a production server. So I can create a scheme that lets me just automatically run the application against the staging server. And here I've set the API URL um, as a run environment <coughs> argument. And for the other scheme, I've now set it to a different URL. So now this is the staging URL. So now I've got an option within the app that is determined by the scheme that I select. And I can easily change schemes within Xcode. So this is a great productivity boost. So here I have my scheme all ready to go. Uh, a tip here would be that if you're working with um, a team, is that you'd want to share these. So this tick box on the right indicates that this will be moved to a directory that should be tracked by Git. Um, if you've just Googled and got a, um, a good Git ignore for iOS or Xcode projects from GitHub or something, usually the directory that it will move the shared schemes into will be tracked. The ones that aren't shared are not tracked by Git. Of course, you can do whatever you want with Git, so yeah. And also, if you're kind of doing lots of crazy stuff in your schemes like I do, you probably don't want to share them because no one's interested in what craziness you're getting up to. Especially if you're turning on things like zombie objects and all those diagnostic tools. Um, that's probably specific to a problem that you're working on right this time. Um, so I often create a scheme on every project uh, that I name after myself, or I use emojis in the name so it stands out. And that is where I kind of have a playground where I can do a lot of messing around. And try not to edit the shared schemes unless you actually intend to edit them and then share those edits with other people. So don't go turn on, you know, malloc scribble on your main scheme because then everyone will, without knowing, have malloc scribble enabled. So, are there any questions on that? Yes. Yeah, um, for passing arguments on launch, uh, yep. we tried that before and we found the limitation um, that it only uh, pass, uh, it only passes if we launch it from Xcode. Yes. That's the case? Yes. Uh, so the, the run environment is only when you actually run and Xcode is the one launching the application. Yeah. If, if it's on a device and then you disconnect from Xcode and then run it again, correct, those settings, those arguments don't come back. Yeah. Um, in that case, I would suggest putting them in uh, a settings bundle so that you can actually set them when you're away from Xcode and go and change them. Um, but you could still use a scheme as a shortcut, I guess, so that when you are connected to the debugger, you can really quickly uh, just change from a different set of user defaults to another. Yeah, and, and we also found that uh, when we pass arguments on launch, it actually misses sometimes. <laughs> I'm not sure if you found it, but if we, even if we launch from Xcode directly, it's like maybe 30% of the time it won't actually pass it successfully. Is that a is that on an Xcode like beta? Is that in a beta or? No. no okay, I haven't really come across that. Yeah. Um, it isn't very smart at telling you if you have, you know, missed a dash or added an extra space somewhere. So it could be that. Um, well, we're seeing it um, not passing it consistently. 
OK. And randomly. I guess the, the saying here is uh, file radar, right? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's been pretty reliable uh, for my uses. Um, you could possibly be running into some kind of like length limitation if you have a ton of uh, arguments, maybe. Um, I'm not sure. Um, we can talk later if you want. Thanks for that. Um, since the time got shifted, I am not sure if I'm over time or not. Is there a handler? John, how much time do I have now? Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. OK, then. OK, we have plenty of time. So <laughs> configuration and a framework. So if you've done Xcode UI testing, uh, you might have noticed that it runs in a separate process. So if you have network requests going in your application, you need to stub those. Um, but you only want to stub them when you're running your UI test. You don't want to stub it all the time. And if you do use something like OHTTP stubs to stub network requests within your UI tests, that only stubs network requests coming from your UI tests. It doesn't actually stub them in your app. So there's this kind of, there's this two process thing going on. Um, can be quite annoying, um, especially if you don't realize that. So if you put stubbing code in a framework, then you can inject that framework into your application and Bonus, it works outside of tests too. So you can create a scheme that also has all these stubs enabled in your application when you run it. Um, I believe I do have time, so I can do a quick demo. No one can see that. I'll drag it over. So it's easier for you. It's probably not easier. I will enlarge it. Um, so here I have a application tuple. My screen's actually obscured over here, so I'll try and make do. Uh, so here we have an application, and it's got an extra target here, uh, which is a stubs framework. So within this stubs framework, what have I done? So in the stubs framework, I might sit down for this. So within the stubs framework, I've actually written all my OHTTP stubs code within a framework. And I've included the OHTTP stubs library uh, within that framework. So it's kind of a framework inception thing kind of going on. So now when I'm in my UI tests, UI tests are interesting because when the UI test target gets launched, that target is actually able to then launch your application. And it does so with app.launch on the XEUI application object. And it turns out we can specify launch arguments here as well. So here, I'm sending an argument dash dash enable stubs to my application. In my application, I have some code here, which after I made this demo, I realized might not actually be necessary. Um, there is such a thing as weak frameworks, which are frameworks that get linked at runtime in your application if the framework exists within the bundle. Um, so we could have basically just done what we did earlier with the configuration resources and just included a framework based on the configuration. Um, but nevertheless, here is some code that basically just will try and load this framework if this argument is present. So if I'm trying to enable stubs, then I'll try and load the stubs framework. So this won't happen in production, and I could, you know, if def it out to make double sure, or even better, use a, a weak framework build setting. So the real, the real magic here is actually a build phase, once again, who knew? So here we've got a build phase. 
here we've got a build phase that's going to copy my stubs framework into the application. And you know what? It's going to be based on the configuration. So here is the script. Sorry, it's not abbreviated. Um, this is available online, of course, like everything. Um, so quick walkthrough of this is if the configuration is debug, and again, we could have created a custom build setting so that you could simply have stubs yes, no in your build settings for your target based on the configuration. That's an improvement you can make here. Um, basically, this code copies the library. This code code signs the library, which Xcode does automatically for you if you've just dragged the framework um, and linked it to a target. It'll say, all right, I'll do the build phase to copy that framework. I'll code sign it. I'll take care of most of that. Um, so here, once again, we're kind of escaping out of uh, Xcode's comfortable warm arms and doing it ourselves. So we have to code sign the library, which is a pain. Um, but luckily, all the, all the build settings for code signing are available to us, just like they're available to uh, Xcode itself. So I'm just going to piggyback on that and grab that expanded code sign identity, code sign the framework, and I'm going to copy it in. We've got some uh, nice little sort of diagnostic messages here where I'm echoing, like I did before. So this will show up in a build log. So I can easily see if the build fails, you know, what happened, did code signing fail, or um, whatever. And it'll tell me if it actually copied the framework or not, which is helpful. So I guess since I have time, we could try and um, do this thing. So here I have created, right. here I've created uh, a scheme that is uh, my app, but with stubs. If I, that's the wrong thing. If I edit this scheme, you'll see that I'm just using the debug configuration. So any debug build will have the, uh, the stubs framework copied and code signed into it, um, but it'll only be activated if I use that runtime argument. So I'm kind of using almost all the systems I've talked about here to kind of orchestrate this. And yes, it can get confusing, but whatever. Um, so I now have a simple UI test that is just going to say, did I get post? Um, hopefully, this demo might or might not rely on internet or not internet. I can't remember. But let's just wing it. So hopefully this test will fail. Here's a humongous, I don't know, small simulator. Can you also assert that this is not even doing the test for you? Uh, so you do, but you will get a problem if it doesn't. These tests might not be great tests, yes. <laughs> I'm actually going to probably put a breakpoint here. Sorry, I dismissed. So I think, unfortunately, that did work because I have internet access. I'm going to turn off my Wi-Fi and run that again. So what if we didn't have internet access? Then my tests aren't going to work, which isn't very good, um, especially if you're running these as continuous integration. Um, if a server goes down, you don't want the app, you don't want the test to fail. Well, I think it might have worked anyway for some reason. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, thank you. Um, <coughs> sorry about that. That's my uh, test succeeded sound. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. Amazing. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'll turn down the volume. No, I won't mute it. Actually, I can't control the volume. Sorry. Um, maybe I won't run the other. Maybe I won't get this demo working to save your ears. Um, 
But basically, if I had things in order, only the stubs one uh, would work properly. Um, I can't control the sound. I hope I don't hurt anyone. Here we're going to see at least that this will be different content coming through. Maybe not. All right, that demo didn't work. That's all right. You just have to trust me on that one. What did I do? Let's just check. Ah, I think I know the problem. Ah, OK. So forget the UI tests for a minute. Let's just run the app. I forgot to uh, comment out this line when I ran the tests. So we see here, I don't have internet connection. My app doesn't work, which isn't very good. Sorry. There it is again. So now if I select the, the stub scheme that I created, this passes that argument for me. Now I've got some stub data there. Isn't that great? So there I have, so this is also can be driven through the UI test as we saw earlier um, with launch arguments which you can change in the, uh, the UI test. So this is a, another really cool way to use launch arguments and why you might want to use them even if you're not using schemes to take advantage of that. Uh, let me resume my slides. Um, so that script is based on another script I wrote um, that will inject the reveal library. If you've used the reveal application, I hear it's pretty cool. Um, maybe just Google it real quickly after this. Uh, reveal app, it's great, get it, maybe Melbourne, all that stuff. Um, it's, a, it's a view introspection tool. Um, you do need to link it into your application, but again, what if we use configurations to do that conditionally? Um, I have super ran out of time. I really wanted to share with you some breakpoint tips as well. Um, that, that'll have to be next year, I guess. Okay, then that's it. Thank you. Thank you.